I know what the night knows. Carmody wakes up mid-afternoon, sits on the edge of his bed in unclean underwear, smoking a cigarette. The black ladies are back at the swimming pool. His veranda door is open and their rap music drifts up. Goddamn rap music sets his teeth on edge. Why can't they listen to rock and roll like everybody else? Ain't about to say anything to him, though. The black ladies got these badass boyfriends who come around three, four times a week. Big black Lincolns they drive. Not real hard to figure out what people like them have to do to get cars like those. He stands at the veranda door a while longer, taking in the white, hot heat of the afternoon, the scent of the pine trees that form a windbreak to the east, the odors of gasoline fumes from the parking lot, and the stench of chlorine from the pool. In the next half hour, he sits on the john, reading the second half of a penthouse article on the CIA, and looking at the gals, of course, but getting sentimental for the days when tits were tits, and not big balloons of silicone, and then takes a quick shave and an even quicker shower. Three o'clock, he stands at his veranda door again, smoking another weed and looking down on the swimming pool, pearl blue water shimmering in the sunlight. The black ladies are gone. Now the two stews who live on the third floor are sunning themselves by the pool. Class stuff, the sort that he's never been able to get even close to. The sort of stuff he used to dream about in high school. Cheerleader stuff, rich girl stuff. Why would a somebody like that want to make it with a cabbie? He turns back to the shadows of his apartment. Of course there are cabbies, and then there are cabbies. He doesn't know a single one of the other boys or girls who lives in a nice, big, modern apartment like this one. They can't afford it. They don't have Carmody's little side gig to sweeten their incomes. Sometimes he still can't believe his good fortune, how he's able to live out here in the suburbs, far from the sirens and screams and blood of the city, and eat good food and take out nice, respectable women every other weekend or so, and buy himself just about anything he wants. A couple weeks from now, he'll turn 36. He plans to buy himself a brand new Pontiac. Never owned a new car in his life. His old man struggled all his life at the factory and never owned a new car. Checks his watch and decides he'd better step on it. He likes to hit the street around 4.30, just before the skyscrapers downtown start to empty out. If he really hustles, a guy can get himself three, four hours of very profitable fares during the afternoon rush hour. He goes into his bedroom and opens the top drawer of his bureau. The first thing he takes out is his forty-five. Keeps it clean. Keeps it loaded. Any cabbie who doesn't pack heat in these times is crazy. The second thing he does is take two crisp $100 bills from the large stack of hundreds, kept under his stash of socks. He is well paid for the little extra service he makes available to the patrons of his cab. That's how he can afford to live here. That's how he can afford to buy himself a new car. He puts the gun in his right pocket, the money in his wallet, and leaves. When he first started driving right after he got laid off at the mall where he'd been selling shoes, Carmody had two fantasies. A. That some night he'd glance in his rearview mirror and see this real voluptuous babe completely naked and beckoning for him to join her in the back seat, and that, B, some real rich guy would be so drunk that he'd tumble out of the cab and drop his wallet, which would just happen to be stuffed with thousand-dollar bills. Thus far, neither of those fantasies had come true yet. And they don't come true today, either. Rush hour is horns, curses, Shrieking tire rubber, middle fingers stabbing the air, grotesque, enraged faces, and threats. Because of the relentless heat and what the heat does to tempers, two drivers in three days have been murdered in the street after becoming involved in minor traffic accidents. The two trips to the airport are especially lucrative for Carmody. Nice fares to begin with, and then nice tips on top of it. Pleasant people, too. Some people treat cabbies like scum. Just at dusk, the sunset bleeding all down the sky like a mortal wound, Carmody whips into this one restaurant where cabbies hang out, has himself a glass of iced tea. Problem is, these days, he don't speak the language so good, because the language is no longer American. It's this kind of 
pidgin language that is actually six or seven different tongues being spoken to approximate American. The faces, too, have changed. When he started out, most of the faces were white, and then they turned half black, which he didn't mind. But now they're various shades of brown and yellow, and that he's not so happy with. The black faces were American. These faces? He gets enough money saved up? He's going to quit. Used to be a nice job, driving a taxi, but these days... Hey, Carmody! It's Sullivan, the owner of this little restaurant. The only thing Carmody's got against Sullivan, who is a nice guy, is his apron. Lots of jokes that Sullivan always does his own butchering out in the alley. His white apron is always streaked red with blood. His hands are always streaked red with blood. He once handed Carmody a powdered sugar donut and got sticky red fingerprints on the damn thing. The other thing Carmody has against Sullivan is his taste in jukebox music. All that country western crap. What the hell's wrong with good old American rock and roll anyway? This is a place where frying grease, cigarette smoke, bad toilet facilities, and terrible ventilation can choke you up on the wrong night. How they hangin', Carmody? Sullivan asks. Carmody shrugs. Ah, uh, you know. How's the iced tea? Fine. Tryin' a different brand. Guy at the wholesaler give me a price on some English stuff. You know how the English love tea. Right. Carmody sips some tea. The heat has already taken its toll on him. He feels older than he should and wearier. You back on a snatch patrol, huh? Sullivan grins with his brilliant white store bots. Snatch patrol? Yeah, this babe was in to see a while ago. Carmody instantly senses what this news may mean. He no longer feels so old or weary. Yeah? Yeah, nice legs, nice tits, very nice dresser. Looks like money. She leave a name? Nah. She just said she'd see you later tonight. Another person interested in Carmody's special services. He almost smiles. He's getting a rep, and a rep means more and more money. You know something? Carmody says. What? He holds up his iced tea glass for Sullivan to see. You should buy some more of this stuff. Yeah? Yeah, it's great. Suddenly, Carmody's no longer in a dingy dive. He's in a very nice restaurant, wearing a brand new Armani, sitting next to this very rich, very elegant woman who can't keep her eyes off him. He's getting a rep. And when he gets a rep enough, he really will be sitting in such a place with such a woman across from him. He stands up, stretches. Well... Guess I'd better get back to it. You ain't gonna tell me? Sullivan says. Tell you what? Who she is? Just this chick. Just this chick? Chick like that and you call her just this chick? You must have something going that I can't see, Carmody. I mean, no offense, but you don't exactly look like a movie star. Yeah? Look who's talking. But I don't got chicks like that coming in asking for me. Carmody grins. No, I guess you don't, do you? He throws three wrinkled dollar bills on the counter and walks out, his ears filled with country music and with the cacophony of several foreign languages being spoken at once. He goes and stands out on the sidewalk, looks left down the street and sees all the triple X marquees and the other sex shops. Looks right and sees all the foreign food restaurants. Thai, Chinese, Lebanese, Greek. What the hell happened to the good old American burger, anyway? Smokes a cigarette. Ingests all the smells of people. Sweat and perfume and cigarette smoke. And then the peculiar odors of neon and concrete and glass. Odors that maybe only he can smell. For a long moment, driving now, 
He is one with the urban night. All the hope and lust and fear and joy and terror of the urban night. Carmody and his taxi. As always, he listens to his golden oldies station. How he loves the old tunes. Chick. Looking for him. Looked like money, Sullivan said. Carmody's gonna get lucky again. Have some more money to add to his ever-growing stash in his bureau drawer upstairs in his nice white boy suburban apartment. One with the night. He is. It is ten o'clock now, and the mystery woman has yet to put in an appearance. He wonders if Sullivan wasn't maybe putting him on or something. Ten fucking o'clock, and where is she? Tonight's fares are pretty dull couple of drunken rubes from Des Moines wearing convention hats and giggling about the lap dance place Carmody lets them off at. Very quiet little old lady he takes to and from the supermarket and who gives him a two-dime tip. Snarling, arrogant businessman who is late for his plane and taking it all out on Carmody. To save his sanity, he thinks back to eight months ago, when he really started making some heavy money on the side. Guy with horn-rimmed glasses and a nervous little pink mouth and a big fat briefcase was the guy who brought him the idea. Guy with the horn rims gets in the back seat of his cab one rainy night and says, Drive around. Drive around? Yes. You care where? No. Just drive around? Just drive around. So Carmody just drives around. They're out along the river where the dance boats dock, and the guy says, You know where Carter Avenue is? Sure. Down by the tracks, there. Yeah, sure I know. Why? You ever go there? Finally, Carmody's starting to get a sense of who this guy may be. Do-gooders are always planting passengers in the cabs to demonstrate to City Hall that cab drivers have certain areas where they won't drive. But Carter Avenue is so bad that cabbies won't go there, and they're perfectly willing to admit it to whatever do-gooder happens to be in the back seat spying on them. You want to go to Carter Avenue, I suggest you get in your own car and drive down there. You really believe the stories? The stories? Yes, you know, about the cannibalism and everything. Carmody shrugs. It's possible, I guess. A long, long time ago, Carter Avenue used to be a prosperous industrial area, but then, over the years, the industries there turned it into a toxic waste dump. The EPA closed down all the factories there. No lights, no running water, no police patrols. It is a total and utter wasteland these days, except to the lowest of the homeless. They live there now in the crumbling, toxic debris of the tumble-down buildings and the glowing pools of toxins. Since then, any number of people have been found dead down near Carter Avenue. A few of them have been eaten, at least one of them being alive while the feast went on, at least according to the coroner. But who really wants to find out? Not even the cops want to go down there, and there is no regular patrol. Most of the bodies are found when they wash up downriver, half a mile or so from where the deserted Carter Avenue factories jut out next to the river. You make a lot of money driving this cab, Hornrim says. Yeah, millions. No need to be sarcastic. I don't make shit. Didn't figure you did. How about you? You make a lot of money, mister? I do all right. At least I did till that bitch decided to take me to the cleaners. The bitch being? My wife. Who else? Divorce? Yeah. I was dicking this chick at the office and my wife found out. Made a whole big deal out of it. Carmody still can't figure out why the guy asked him if he made a lot of money. They drive around some more. The guy, silent all of a sudden, staring out the window at night in the city. Then the guy says, What if I told you about a way you could really make some real nice money? I'd listen. You would? Yeah, sure, why wouldn't I? What if this was illegal? Well, there's illegal, and then there's illegal. You know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, my man. So you're going to tell me, or what? Guy laughs. 
You bet I'm going to tell you, my man. You bet. So he tells him. And first thing Carmody thinks is, Wow, that's pretty damned heavy duty. But then Hornrims names a figure and says, And I'd pay you up front. All of it up front? All of it, every penny. Wow. Wow is right, Hornrim says. Bet you never thought you could make that much money so easy, did you? I have to think about it. How about if you pick me up at the same place tomorrow night and we drive around and talk some more? That sounds all right. Tomorrow night, then. And now it is eight months later, and Carmody has over forty thousand dollars cash hidden in his bureau at home. Forty thousand is not the kind of money most cabbies ever see at one time. Around eleven, he decides to pull into the cab stand over on Eighteenth Street, get out and smoke a weed, and stretch his legs. And that's when he sees her. She is sitting on a bus bench, but city buses stopped running an hour ago. She doesn't belong in this neighborhood. He pulls over to the curb, gets out, leans up against the cab, smokes a cigarette. The night is shrill suddenly, with a woman screaming and a man yelling back at her. Domestic squabble, and then she's there, right next to him, her perfume making him dizzy with its erotic promise. She is one of the loveliest women he's ever seen. So delicate of bone, so regal of bearing that she seems almost unearthly in her shimmering ivory-colored summer dress. She carries a straw summer bag that matches the color of the dress. I've been looking for you, she says. Her voice is rich with promise as her perfume. I decided to try you here. She smiles. Is your cab available? He gulps, feeling like a ten-year-old. He's lost all his street poise, all his focus. He is nothing more than a receptacle of her beauty. Sure, he manages to say. Sure, it's available. He opens the back door for her, and she gets inside. Only then does he notice something faintly familiar about her: some gesture, some angle of neck, and angle of something familiar. But what? Then he's driving. Any place in particular? The West Side. Oh. He's surprised. What would a woman like her be doing on the west side? Her perfume continues to seduce him. He constantly glances in the rearview mirror and sees her gaze there, watching him as intently as he's watching her. The sodium vapor lights begin to vanish. Old-fashioned street lights now appear, and not too many of them. They are just now reaching the west side. By the time they've gone eight blocks, he's twice had to pull over for ambulances shrieking past. She smiles. Nice area. Yeah, I was kind of surprised when you wanted to come over here. The houses are drab and dirty now, and not much bigger than shacks. Hookers and pimps stroll the sidewalks. In front of neon bars and country western taverns, bloody men fight bloody fights. Onlookers urging them on. In front of one little shack, a man is beating up a woman as a little girl tries to get between them and push the man away. Carmody glances in the rearview mirror. You haven't figured it out yet, have you? Figured what out? He says. But all she does for now is smile again. Any place in particular? Just keep heading out this street. This street. He thinks, he wonders if she knows where this street leads. The touch of her long silken fingers almost makes him jump, scares him. But soon enough, as she continues to stroke his neck and the back of his head, soon enough he gives himself utterly to her sensual pleasures. As they're sitting at a stoplight, he even closes his eyes. Wow, he says. What's all this about? I just happen to know how lonely people get in the city, she says. That's the irony. 
all these people around them crowding in on them. And still, city people are the loneliest people of all. She continues to stroke him. Then she laughs softly. The light's green. We better go. He gives the cab some gas. She's really starting to get to him. There's something about her, about this whole situation, that makes him extremely nervous. But no amount of caution can deny her hold on him. I know a nice place where we can be alone. Yeah? Yeah. Where? Just keep driving. Ma'am, you have any idea where we're headed? Yes, I do. Carter Avenue. I'm very familiar with Carter Avenue, she says. I don't think we should go there. This time, she doesn't simply stroke his neck. She kisses it as well, her breath warm on his flesh, her lips tender and knowing. The funny thing is, he doesn't think of sex this time, at least not sex by itself. He's thinking about her line about city people and how lonely they are. His whole body is shaking. She holds the promise of more than quick sex. She holds the promise of making him feel alive again, connected to something other than his cab and the filthy nights of the city. How can he say no to her? He aims the cab toward Carter Avenue. She sits back now. He can't even see her eyes in the rearview mirror. I hear you help people, Mr. Carmody. Help people? People with troubles? Oh, where'd you hear something like that? I did a very serious investigation of you. You did, huh? Yes, and I learned that you helped out a man named McGrath seven months ago. He tell you that? Yes, he did, she says. Now this moment is starting to take a familiar shape. All the flirting, she merely wants to ensure that he'll help her out. Probably figures, how can he resist a beautiful woman like me, especially one who's also going to pay him a lot of money? This McGrath, he tell you how much I charge? Yes. And that doesn't bother you? Not at all. Then, did you hear about Mr. McGrath? Hear about him? On the news? A week ago? No, I guess I didn't. He drowned in his own swimming pool. Wow. He told me all about you, Mr. Carmody. What you do, I mean. Her icy blue gaze is in the rear view again. He smiles. I aim to please. She leans up near him again. I look familiar to you, don't I, Mr. Carmody? A little, I guess. You drive a cab, everybody starts to look a little familiar. He hears a snapping sound, decides she's opened her purse. Here comes Carter Avenue, Mr. Carmody. You sure you want to go here? Positive. His public smile again. You're the boss. Here the streetlights are only occasional now. Here, through the open cap windows, come all sorts of grunts and growls and cries and crazed laughter that can be heard on the empty floors of the deserted factories now. Which is when the naked woman with the butcher knife jumps on the hood of the taxi, out of nowhere. One moment, Carmody and his fare are driving down the potholed street, and then suddenly a naked woman with wild, filthy hair... No teeth and what appear to be teeth marks all over her pitiful chest and arms. All of a sudden she's hurled herself out of the darkness onto the hood and is wildly waving a blood-stained butcher knife in front of the windshield. Roll up your windows, Carmody shouts. Then he floors the accelerator. The woman is strong enough and crafty enough to hang on for almost two blocks, sprawled across the hood and clinging to the windshield wipers. But then Carmody starts slamming on the brakes. The woman can't hold on long and doesn't. 
The fourth time he hits the brakes abruptly, the woman goes flying off the hood of the taxi to disappear once more in the skin-crawling darkness of Carter Avenue. Then she cries out like some mad animal and stands naked in the middle of the street, still waving her bloody butcher knife. Carmody sees all this in his rear-view mirror. We're going back, Carmody says. I can't handle it down here. You seem to be all right when somebody pays you, Mr. Carmody. And now he learns what the beautiful lady took from her open purse a few minutes ago. A silver thirty-eight, which she puts right next to his neck. No more massages. No more kisses. Give me your gun, Mr. Carmody. What? Give me your gun. What choice does he have? He gives her his gun. Now it's your turn, Mr. Carmody. What the hell are you talking about? Pull over here. No way. That's when she puts a bullet right through the windshield. The safety glass makes a giant silver spider web. The noise of the gunshot seems to have awakened the hungry human animals lurking down here in the unclean darkness. They signal back and forth to each other with cries known only to themselves, like birds at dusk. God, are you crazy? Carmody shouts. I told you to pull over. He pulls over. Have you figured it out yet, Mr. Carmody? Carmody is shaking so badly he can barely speak. Figured what out yet? Figured out who I am. Who you are? I'm Mrs. McGrath. My husband paid you to pick me up in your cab, then bring me down here and dump me. He knew that I'd never get out of here alive, and when the police found me, it would look as if some homeless people had attacked me and killed me. My husband didn't have to do the actual killing, and neither did you. You left it to the creatures who live in those factories over there. My dear, sweet husband would have a nice, safe alibi and get all the insurance money. Or did he tell you that, Mr. Carmody? That's why he wanted me dead. He was in love with his secretary, and he wanted the insurance money. But then you've done that for several husbands, haven't you? Their wives call a cab, and you pick them up and bring them down here. A person alone down here doesn't have a chance of getting out alive. And they've all died. All but me, Mr. Carmody. Two drifters held me in a basement here overnight. They took turns raping me, but I escaped. They'd cut up my face so badly that I had to spend three months getting plastic surgery. That's why you didn't recognize me, Mr. Carmody, my new face. I took care of my husband the other night in his brand new swimming pool. And now I'm going to take care of you. He thought of his money, his beautiful, sweet money, back in the bureau in his nice new apartment. Seven women he brought down here. And then he thinks of her, Mrs. McGrath. She is a lot better looking now than when he brought her down here. In an ironic sort of way, he'd done her a favor. Get out of the cab, Mr. Carmody. Oh, no. No way. You heard what I said, Mr. Carmody. I'd prefer for them to get you, but if I have to, I'm perfectly willing to kill you right now. To make her point, she shoots out the other side of the windshield. After the echoes die down, after the safety glass once again becomes an intricate spider web, he can hear the calls and cries once more, the human animals in the surrounding darkness, talking back and forth in their special code. Get out, Mr. Carmody. No. Please. She puts the gun directly against his right temple. Get out. What choice does he have? He opens the door and climbs out. How safe and snug the cab looks, even with its windshield blown out. He stands in the darkness, the thousand windows of the empty factory staring down at him like a thousand different eyes. He smells the heat, the garbage, the feces the filth of the factories where they live at night and sleep during the day, waiting for people just like him. She gets out of the back seat and then lets herself into the front seat. You can't do this, he says. You know what they'll do to me. 
She stares at him a long moment, as if remembering something, and says, Remember how I pleaded with you, Mr. Carmody? Remember how I begged you for my life, but you wouldn't help me at all? She reaches forward and stabs a finger at the radio. I also hate your taste in music, Mr. Carmody. Gone is his golden oldies station. Now classical music fills the air. She smiles at him. Even now she's so beautiful. Have a nice day, Mr. Carmody. And then she's gone. He watches as the red taillights wind their way up the potholed streets and finally disappear beyond the edge of a factory. Bitch. Fucking bitch. You can't trust any of them. He's about to start running when he hears a sound behind him. He swivels to hear the sound again. A crone, cackling. And then she's standing there, in the silver light of the moon, the scrawny, filthy, naked woman with the wild, dark eyes and even wilder hair. <laughs> Looks like you need a friend, she giggles. And she lunges at him with her butcher knife, her bloody butcher knife. A few moments later, as the hag kneels next to Carmody's body and strips him of all valuables, her knife is even bloodier.